everybody at Moab. Um, for some of you, you may or may not know, this has been a two, almost three year journey to bring this exhibition to life. I don't remember how the conversation started with, this is also me and Dex's fourth exhibition together. Um, and so we've had the pleasure of collaborating over the last six years. And um, normally after we finish a show, we're gonna be like, okay, what are we gonna do next? <laughs> And um, so this is a manifestation of those you know, conversations. I'm happy it's finally here. Thank you, Lamar, Andrea, for being here. And thank you guys for being here. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, thanks as well. Uh, I won't thank everyone again, because it'll be 7 o'clock. <laughs> but I will just say generally thank you to all. <laughs> I won't do it individually. Um, and uh, also, I want to um, answer Larry's question about like, how the conversation about this exhibition began. Because um, I remember it uh, pretty clearly. Um, so, as he mentioned, this is our fourth time collaborating on the show, and I will say that it is not actually a common thing for um, independent curators. You're not independent anymore fully, but you know, independent-minded curators to work as collaboratively as Larry and I have over the years. A lot of that has to do with the mutual respect we have for one another, but more importantly the respect that we have for visual artists. And, um, and I think that that respect has kind of driven us to try to do ambitious projects. And when you try to do something very ambitious and you are working either independently or working, you know, um, without being the framework necessarily of a big institution, which the way I've been working for many, many years, um, you know when you got some heavy lifting to do, and it's often wise to have a, a, you know, a partner <laughs> to work with you through that process. Um, not only the logistics of the curatorial process, of you know, all the administrative stuff that goes along with that, and I'm sure some of you know how grinding that work can be, but also to think about it in terms of, of having an open and objective mind as it relates to the artists that you want to collaborate with. Um, Andrea and I here are actually like uh, laughing we because we never met before <laughs> this moment sitting here. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah, I know. And so um, the reason I want to point that out before we get into the nitty gritty about the show is that um, you know oftentimes as ideas sort of, sort of like you know germinate, you will often just kind of reach out to the people who are at arm's length, and we all see this, right? You see shows sort of like, oh, that curator always works with those artists, or those artists always work with those institutions. And I think Larry and I both try to challenge ourselves to get outside of our circles, outside of our comfort zones, and to do things that um, are not um, expected. And so I want to, you know, say, you know, really thank you to you two again, because you know the relationship between a curator and an artist is one that I think is quite mysterious to a lot of people. Um, for me, it's a very close relationship, and it's one that requires a lot of trust. So thank you guys for trusting us to do this. And back to the other question before I pass on the mic and not talk so much. So one day um, I was driving thinking about um, this idea of whether or not we live in a post-colonial or a colonial world. And um, I don't read a lot of newspapers because who has the time? Um, but also, um, you know, the one newspaper that I do read every Sunday or Saturday or Sunday is the Financial Times. It's the only like tangible paper I read. I mean, we all go online and we see the New York Times or San Francisco Chronicle or what have you, but it's a tangible paper. And I hang on to them for weeks because it takes me that long to get through one, so they stack up. And the reason I point out the Financial Times is because that newspaper um, is very global in nature. And it talks not only about business, but also entertainment and culture and art. And it kind of gives you a very uh, sort of interesting snapshot of what's happening in the world at any one given moment. But it's also written from a very British perspective as well. And as an American, you read this and you can kind of see the difference between how things are framed. And so um, as I was thinking about this idea of whether or not we live in a colonial or post-colonial world, that newspaper is something that I kind of kept going back to. And I started finding, at least in my opinion, all of this evidence that we're not actually living in a post-colonial world. And so, um, and so the, uh, the I said I just started seeing all this evidence that we don't actually live in a post-colonial world, um, and we'll get into that. I'll let you guys get into that. Uh, and so the name of the show, and this will be the last thing I'll say for now. The name of the show was sort of uh, my attempt at coming up with a way to frame a very heavy and weighted subject in a way that people would find intriguing and not necessarily so like on the nose. 
Um, I also happen to like all four things that are in the title, so that's like uh, another personal thing. Um, and you, you do not want to hear the early iterations of this title. Trust me, you landed somewhere really good. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll move back to, to Larry. Thank you. So I think it would be interesting because I haven't really specific, we haven't asked, specifically asked, um, why did you say yes to being in this show? I did. Because I sent you, I sent you, I sent both of you guys an email and you, you were like, sure, let's do it. So why did you say yes? What was it about the dialogue that we were aiming to have through this exhibition? How did you feel it related to your practice? I think for me, I mean, so, so being from the Bahamas, I grew up there till 21. Um, it was a familiar place for me. Um, uh, specifically, coming from what I was taught in elementary school. I mean, you know it as elementary, you know it as, as primary school. So what I was taught in primary school in my history classes as opposed to what I was taught in college as opposed to being a professional researcher now, what I'm learning today. Um, so I feel like there was a great um, disparity in, 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 in the lessons that were taught and I thought that it would have been a great jumping off point to kind of enter an exhibition such as this. Uh, but also knowing that my current practice is a detour from what I was taught in elementary school, <coughs> in, 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 um, in high school, you know. So, so I'm definitely always pushing against those those colonial lessons that I learned, you know, um, just knowing that the lessons learned was always from the um, the oppressor for most parts, um, and just trying to push a, push against those ideas. And uh, if I could just jump in and, and say, Andrea, you know, your work actually um, has it's really been intriguing to me for a long time, and I haven't had the opportunity prior to this show to see much of it in person, so I've been sort of like looking at you digitally for quite some time. And the work has a very different feel in person, which, you know, most great art does, right? Like you, you think you've seen it until you've actually seen it. But could you talk a little bit about, I guess to answer Larry's questions as well, I guess you could tell us why you said yes. But also I want to hear from you to hear a bit more about like uh, the history of your work leading up to the piece that we see upstairs, because you've been kind of dealing with this kind of subject matter for quite some time. Um, I agree to do this because I think almost everyone in this show is a friend. Um, <laughs> and it's nice to work with friends, and especially friends whose work you respect. Um, I think this is the third show that LeVar and I will be in together. Um, we're in the Paris Hood together this summer. Ebony has been incredibly impactful to my career. She's been somebody that I have gone to for advice. And um, I respect her opinion, so I always show her my work. Like, there's very few people that I think that you can be vulnerable with. And she's definitely been somebody that um, has very much impacted me. And we're, I would say we're pretty tight. The way that I've met Scott Hugan, we've known each other for 10 years. So it's nice to be able to work with friends and with, especially friends whose work you kind you constantly look to for inspiration. I mean, thoroughly draws in a way that makes me excited about drawing and painting again. And I hate painting. Um, <laughs> but her work makes me so incredibly excited to see the work. Um, as far as um, the piece that's upstairs, I've been working with Sugar since grad school, since 2007, and I have both a um, um, historical connection to it as far as having parents from the Caribbean, um, but also a, a personal connection to it in the sense that um, my grandmother had her second, she died having her second leg amputated from gangrene from having diabetes. So this is something that is very much um, a part of my culture and very much a part of my family and something that I myself have to look out for. Like I can't eat too many sugary things because I'm susceptible to getting diabetes. Um, it affects um, women's uh, fibroids, like that sugar helps those fibroids to grow, which is something that I've experienced. So I have like a very connected um, a connection to this material. Um, and it's a material that is incredibly challenging and I've struggled with from 2007 on and is always constantly teaching me something new. Um, it's very, it's 
seductive and tasty and sweet and also just very impactful to who I am. Thank you, thank you. Um, Larry, you want to jump in? Um, well, yes. I have a question for you, and then I have a question for you. Can you talk a little bit about, because we went through a tour earlier, the elements that are actually in these pieces? Because you had like hymn, hymns, um, some of the texts you found here in San Francisco. So can you just talk a little bit about like the work in this show and then how, how did you think it would uh, <coughs> contribute to this conversation that we have? Um, so the work is all made out of sugar. It's um, sugar that I cook, almost like you would cook a piece of um, candy, like hard candy. Um, and I, prior to coming here, I had created um, silicone molds of um, various shapes of Bibles. Um, and I was really interested in the Audrey Lord quote that um, you can't dismantle the master's house using the master's tools. And I've sort of been exploring that quote for about a year now and thinking about um, various tools that have been used. Um, and I think that religion is a huge tool that has been used. Um, so um, it's also something that people found peace from. And you know, the Underground Railroad wouldn't have probably happened without the Bible being out there. Um, so I just want to sort of talk about the complications of all of that um, and how it's also been twisted and misused in a lot of ways to justify you know, killing anyone who's gay or um, interracial couples, justifying slavery. So a lot of the hymns that I found um, were from a book that I found here in San Francisco. And I was specifically looking for Amazing Grace because that is like the epitome of um, a black church, mm -hmm. like growing up in the South, like that is like the epitome of what I would hear there. Um, so I was specifically looking for that, included that in some of the, in one of the Bibles um, but I also included um, various beads to sort of talk about things that were also brought over um, from Africa. So, um, and how the Bible was used to sort of disguise those practices. So um, there's Orishas that people would pray to. Um, they would take saints from the Bible to disguise it so that they could still pray to them. So I included beads, I included herbs that were, medicinal herbs that were used by midwives. Um, I included rice that was um, oftentimes the women would cornrow their hair and hide grains of rice in their hair so that they could come and plant those when they got to wherever they were going. So all of those things are sort of um, kind of cooked into the Bible. And then I also included, um, was really interested in um, the slave Bible and how there were books of the Bible that were um, that were redacted um, so that slave masters could justify slavery, and if those um, those aspects of the Bible had remained in the Bible that they passed out to slaves, then there would have been an argument for why they should be enslaved. So a lot of the um, the pages that are um, dipped in sugar are pages that were redacted. Um, I, I, love for, I love for us to talk, um, and, and thank you for that, I love for us to talk tangibly about um, colonialism and post-colonialism as it relates to the show. Because I think that um, one of the, the questions that people are likely to have as they navigate their, their way through the exhibition um, is, is just how each of these artists are sort of dealing with that. And we've attempted to, to kind of get into that on some of the extended wall labels and some of the other um, you know materials for the show. But since we're here and we can talk about it, I'd love to kind of get into that a bit. I mean, I know that um, the relationship between uh, you know Europe and the Caribbean and, and sort of so many places in the Western Hemisphere. Um, it's very fraught with, you know, a history of slavery, a history of subjugation, and, and, and but I'm also interested in this sort of like contemporary way of looking at the legacy of all of that, particularly through economics, and maybe we could start with economics because that's something that's very, um, I, I think very important and also something people can sort of like relate to. Um, like for example, you know the relationship between you know Haiti and France mm -hmm. as it relates to you know Haiti's independence and how that um, you know that that liberating you know Haiti liberating itself from France put it into a situation where it was almost like an eternal debt and being punished and being punished for its own freedom. And I don't think that there's any coincidence that um, 
the state of affairs in Haiti are the way that they are, given that legacy. But I'm also quite intrigued about the relationship between Haiti and Dominican Republic as well. Mm -hmm. and, and I wish a couple of the artists from the DR were also here to join us um, to kind of get their take on that. So, so many different entry points in this, but since since you guys are here, we you know, and I'd love to hear more from you. So, starting with you, Lavar. I mean, you know, being from the Bahamas, a very interesting history, right, in place. Um, very different from say Haiti and the DR, of course. Right, but could you talk a little bit about like your perceptions of like this sort of like colonial or post-colonial um, world in, in say the Bahamas, for example, and, and maybe you have a couple of examples of how you view that. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and obviously, it still exists, um, big time. Um, so we are part of the Commonwealth, um, meaning that we are still subjugated to the Queen. Um, so a lot of our judicial systems, it has to be okayed by the Queen. And by the Queen, you mean the Queen of England? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not Beyonce. <Yeah. laughs> not, definitely not Beyonce. <laughs> Just want to be clear. <laughs> yes, not Beyonce, but the Queen of England. <laughs> Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah, so um so so everything has, has to go to the Queen. I'm Queen Elizabeth. Um, in order to get okay by the Bahamas. So stuff such as corporate punishment for instance. Um, so one time ago corporate punishment was was very it was a very active part of our society, so people who murdered were hung. Um, but very recently, probably within the last, I want to say, 10 years, 10 to 15 years, um, Britain stepped in and they were like, okay, this is inhumane, which I agree it is very inhumane to hang somebody. Um, and they kind of took it off the records. So the Bahamas is not allowed to do such a thing now. Um, but I think a lot of how we, like our mannerisms, how we're taught in school, again, it's, it's, it's through the British system. Um, and I kind of mentioned it briefly um, about the histories that we learned. Again, we are learning from British books. This is how we lived, and this is how we are to live, and this, and this is how we continue to live. Um, I think another great example, too, is, is um, our lawyers. So I have many friends who are lawyers who reside in the Bahamas. And they just, their attire alone is all British, you know. Um, they wear these robes, they wear these wigs. wigs, these blonde wigs. So black men with blonde wigs walking around with dresses, I mean. Like, but again, this is from our colonial past, you know. Um, and there is, I don't see it changing anytime soon, you know. Um, I think it's this one-way system. Um, and I think also interesting, interesting about the Bahamas, so in 1974 we gained our independence. So we are an uh, independent nation. We just happen to be under the, the Commonwealth of Nations. And so the Commonwealth kind of trumps our independence in many, many ways. Wow, that's very interesting. Uh, I don't believe in post-colonialism. I think that we are still experiencing colonialism that's just taking me on the face. Um, you can call it settler colonialism. Um, I think that um, institutions like the IMF um, definitely impose colonialism. Um, and I think specifically um, in the Caribbean, we've moved from one service economy, which is um, rum, sugar, or coffee, and we've gone into tourism. Mm. And there's no escaping that. And one just replaced the other. And there's no way to sustainably you know, manage an economy on something like tourism, and especially when you have um, climate change to think about. You know, like Puerto Rico was completely wiped out. How do you, how do you survive off of tourism when you can't even get electricity? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great point. Great point. And to piggyback that, um, I think I was talking to you or you. Um, could we talk a little bit more about this notion of paradise, right? As as, as part of this kind of tourism facade, so to speak, because I was just in Nassau and it was interesting to talk to people about paradise being a social construction and that most behemoths don't go to the beach. Yeah. And it's like, how is that possible? <laughs> you know, so I guess if we could talk a little bit about this notion of paradise and, and the relationship all, to yeah, tourism. It's all taken from the Bible, like the idea of Eden mm -hmm. being this paradise. And that's how a lot of the islands were sort of constructed to be this 
garden to me. Mm -hmm. So like if you live in Caribbean, a lot of stuff there isn't natural. Mm -hmm. Like palm trees are not native to the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Mango is not native to the Caribbean. Breadfruit, all of those things were brought to feed slaves. Mm -hmm. um, just a lot of that was just constructed of what their idea of what paradise is. Mm -hmm. And I mean, like, you know, saying that Bunny is over the beach, in Jamaica, some people don't even have access to the beach mm -hmm. because it's all privatized land. Mm -hmm. So people who live there can't go to the beach, which makes absolutely no sense because it's not. Mm -hmm. and you also see that in some parts of America. I don't want to do, yeah. divert too much, but when people think that that's sort of like relegated to some specific part of the world, it's actually pervasive, you know? Yeah, and again, what, what Andrea and Dexter is, is kind of alluding to is something that I'm, I guess I'm not familiar with too. I mean, I think now we're seeing privatized beaches in, in, in Nassau, you know? Um, but also, yeah, this notion of paradise. You know, what is paradise? You know, I, and I think it's, it's, it's a very good way to kind of enter such a conversation, you know? Um, so tourism being our main industry, it's the Bahamas, Nassau is, is advertised in a very particular way. Um, again, because tourism is our number one industry, we keep away, we keep a lot away from the public eye. Um, again, you were in NASA very recently, and I'm sure that you got a chance to see what paradise really is. Yeah, yeah, so so outside, so on the outskirts, we have the, the east and the west. So, so these are like high-end homes. Usually tourists, so usually we have like expats and the Chinese, so the Chinese has taken over pretty much. Just as, yeah, so the Chinese come in and they build these mega hotels and change our road systems and do this and do that, some investment foolishness. Um, but um, but Nassau is not that. Nassau is just one step, a five minute walk from Bay Street, which is like the main thoroughfare is Nassau, and as the deeper we go into the city, into the heart of the city, the more you see what the city is, is, is really about. And I can have this conversation not only about, about Nassau, but many other places that I travel to. Um, I think Senegal is a good, is a good example of that, you know. Um, so we have that airport strip around Senegal where it's very lush and mega hotels and mega homes, and the minute you get one step away from that, it's, it's life, it's real life, you know? Um, and I think the notion of paradise for me is real life. It isn't the mega hotels, it isn't tourism, it isn't the yes mom, yes sir thing, you know, like that isn't what paradise is to me. And I think again, to go back to the conversation about the colonial past, this yes mom, yes sir is from <laughs> the colonial past. like. One thing that irks me is to go home and one of the kids, yes sir, yeah, yes ma'am, yes sir, like really, come on. We are, we are on the same level, like I don't play that yes ma'am hierarchy, yes sir type thing, you know. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's very prevalent, it's, it's how we're taught, you know. Another, I think another good point too is, is the school systems, everybody wear uniforms, so we learn, we, we, we are taught to serve at a very young age, we're taught to wear uniforms, we are part of this, this, this this organization or this or this company we, we 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 are identified by uniforms only so that's how we are taught as from kids growing up so, so yeah yeah I, and I, I wanted to add something to that I mean well, well two things actually so you know when we think about back to your question about paradise so um, what's interesting to me is that you can make very clear comparisons to um, you know let's look at Miami for example Miami is an interesting place for a lot of reasons right. But one of the reasons I think it's a very interesting place is that you know we're only talking about maybe you know 19 years ago, 18 years ago, before, for example, Basel arrived in Miami, where a lot of people that we might consider to be um, you know our colleagues, friends, whatever, in, in in the art world, would never even have ventured to go down there because there's this perception of Miami being like either dangerous or run down or what have you. I remember hearing about Basel going to Miami in the late 90s, hearing like buzz about this big fair that was gonna happen there. And then I think Basel may have debuted around 2002 or something like that, something in that ballpark, maybe a little earlier. Um, and what they were getting pushback on was that no one's gonna go to Miami, Miami's dangerous, right? And so I'm bringing this up to point out that over the course of the past almost two decades, 
we've seen Miami get transformed by mega development, mega gentrification. Um, you know, people who kind of considered Miami home, not 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 Ocean Drive and the whole sort of like you know like that area, but like Miami proper, but seeing the city change to push forward this idea of paradise, right? Mm -hmm. And so we see that happening even in the framework of the United States in, in big cities like Miami, where it's this concept, like paradise is more of like a concept than a construct, and and the people who get in the way of it sort of be damned, right? You, you sort of like push it through in a, in a different way, and you're packaging a place. So when I think about the Caribbean, you know, being someone who was born and raised in the United States and born in Brooklyn, um, my, you know, a lot of the, the uh, friends that I had growing up from various parts of, you know, the South and various parts of the Caribbean, and my perspective of those places was this kind of perspective that a tourist would have. Those places not really understanding, like, the nitty gritty of, like, what it really is like to live there, but more so, like, the postcard version of what it's like to live there, the, the, the version that's pushed forward through, like, economic marketing and, 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 and that kind of like vision of paradise. So I think that it's in, another reason that's intriguing to me is that a lot of the countries that um, or that we're talking about in the Caribbean have were, had sort of reached a point as a result of this colonial relationship with Europe, reached a point where the only thing that they could do was sort of like attract tourism because all of the sort of business and industry had been, you know, taken away or, or zapped out of them as it, as it relates to this kind of like uh, colonial relationship. Yeah, but I will say that a lot of that was planned. Of course. Like tourism was definitely planned. Like once slavery was abolished, um, they didn't know what to do with the land. Mm -hmm. And people were like, nah, I'm not doing this apprenticeship. Like I'm not working here for free so that you can recover from right. your debt. And I mean, if you look at a lot of old photographs, um, during like the late 1800s, early 1900s, a lot of those photographs, um, you'll see of like laborers laying in the cane fields. Those things were produced to attract tourists. They were, because that's not, that is not an occasion that would actually happen. Like you would not see somebody chilling in a cane field, <laughs> chilling on, you know, like that just doesn't happen. And those, all of those things were posed Absolutely. to show that those, that the blacks that lived there were, were docile and subservient. So if you look at a lot of the positions that those laborers were in, and if you look at like a, a tourism magazine now, they're in the same positions. They're oh, laying absolutely. down, they're it's bending over. <laughs> they're all in subservient positions. So th those, those old photos were created to attract white Europeans and white Americans into the country. And I think some countries probably saw the way that functioned for them and sort of latched on to that. And then also encouraged because um, like the US punished Haiti. Mm -hmm. They punished Haiti. There was no way, like there is no way Haiti would have recovered because of the French um, in, in this country just punishing them for being the first free black country in the West. They wanted to make an example out of them. Um, and I think, I think everyone is afraid of that. You know, who wants to be in that kind of poverty? Um, and I th and I think that um, institutions like I said the IMF they have eliminated people's ability to s to sell their own to export their own agricultural goods. They put the limit on what they can, or they reject whatever it is that they they tell them to produce. Like they produce what they say will sell, mm -hmm. and then they reject them on purpose, intentionally, mm -hmm. so that they become dependent on the IMF to give them funding. You know, um, there were two books that also were very inspirational to this exhibition, um, and one of them is The House of Morgan, The History of uh, J.P. Morgan, which we all know of J.P. Morgan. And another lesser known book was a, was a book called The Fish That Ate the Whale. Uh, it's, a, it's a life and times of a, of a gentleman named Sam Zimmery, who, um, long story short, was a Russian immigrant who, um, at this point, uh, more than maybe a hundred years ago, uh, became one of the wealthiest people in the country and almost one of the wealthiest people in the world on the strength of importing bananas into the United States. I bring that up because in reading the life of Sam Zimmery, one of the things that becomes really pronounced is that you had private individuals, uh, and by the way, he's the person who started to funded Tulane University in, in New Orleans. Um, but 
Um, one of the things that becomes very clear in reading his life story is that he was among a handful of private citizens in the United States who were in a position to help, you know, with help from the United States government to literally um, purchase millions of acres of land um, in Central and South America um, and in the Caribbean to grow bananas and was actually in a position to um, usurp governments that were not cooperative with his business plans. So there are more than one example in this book where you would see a local government not want to either sell land or not want to provide labor or something that would stand in the way of his business interests. And he would literally um, get the United States government involved or get private soldiers and get them on boats and just take them down there and just overthrow the government so that he could get the land. Chiquita actually was shooting laborers right. in Honduras. Right. I mean, it's out of control. Like they just So we're not talking about ancient history yeah. here. Mm -hmm. We're talking about um, a history so that's that's, that within the last century um, that we're sort of still seeing the legacy of today. And the reason the subtitle of the exhibition is a post-colonial paradox is that, um, you know, the paradoxical aspect of this is that many people still benefit from this legacy of colonialism and hope, and, and people whose ancestors may have suffered under it, but now they found a way to manipulate it for their own sort of like personal or familial benefit, and they actually perpetuate it in a way that allows them to continue to sort of thrive, even in a very, very small way, even if it means the suffering of many more people. Um, and so I think the paradox is that in order for us to see colonialism for what it is, right, um, we have to sort of accept how complicit we might be in, its, in sustaining it. And that's a reality that I think about, at least for myself, on a regular basis. It's like, what are the actions that I'm doing that I'm conscious of that I could do a different way and not necessarily perpetuate the things that I don't fundamentally believe in? Right, but that's a that's a, like a big thing to, to deal with. No, I mean it's interesting. Like having spent time in Nassau, spent time in Puerto Rico, um, I ask myself that question because we have a lot of conversations around this notion of decolonizing the mind, or decolonizing space. And what does that really mean? And so I'd be curious to hear from both of you as artists. You know, how do you think about or consider that question, and, and how do you use your practice as a platform? to begin to deconstruct those those ideas and notions. Because you talked about earlier with your series Redbone in terms of like creating new narratives, creating new mythologies, telling stories inspired by Senegal. So I guess can you both talk about how you've kind of thought about this question of decolonizing de um, through your practice? Yeah, and I think for me personally, I think it comes honestly to education. Mm -hmm. Education first. You know, so education, but also the notion of travel. You know, so travel becomes a, a very, very um, specific thing in in understanding how society is run, how societies have run, have have been run, um, and and yeah. So so the series um, Larry is referring to is my painting series. I'm doing a. A new series called the Red Bones. Um, so the Red Bones is a term that's associated with the global south. Um, in my history class, I learned about mulattoes, so myths. Um, but yeah, so I'm using that term to kind of build a series of works that is based on a fictitious narrative that speaks about a group of kids. Um, from an impoverished space that are put on the front line by the wealthy within society only to be deemed hero. Um, so the notion of journey becomes a very important thing for me in my work. Um, the notion of heroism becomes a very, very important thing. Um, and, and with journey and both heroism, I'm, I'm borrowing from Joseph Campbell's monument, um, which is also known as the hero's journey. So most most narratives, I mean, if, 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 if most of you are movie watchers, most narratives are, are kind of based on this. So you think about the Disney narratives, the sword and the stone, you think about Robin, Robin Hood, like all of these are based off this notion of the hero's journey. Um, so yes, yeah, so just borrowing that as a, as, a, as a jumping off point, and 
with that series, I, I spent probably the past four or five years in Senegal every year. And what I would do is I would go there. Um, actually, initially when I went there, I went there to do uh, a biennial, the, the, the car biennial. But I got, I mean, since then I've, I've been going back and forth and just having conversations and dialogues um, with people from Senegal, but also doing this exchange program with the kids in Senegal. Um, and in that exchange, I'm taking photographs and I just have tons and tons of them on my computer now. And and are referencing them and trying to make them heroes, you know, um, as opposed to to, to the victims. Um, I, I think it's, it's very important. And again, yes, it's, it's definitely a fictitious narrative, but it's a hopeful narrative. So the notion of hope becomes a very, a very, very important thing within my work. Um, but definitely hero. Who is hero? Who gets to be him? Who hero and for what reasons? So it kind of goes back to the conversation we had prior where most of the, well, most of the stories are, are are told by, by by the victors rather than the victims. But what if the victims get to tell their story? You know, um, and not again, not not deeming myself as a victim, but but, but kind of coming from that, that perspective, trying to give the less the the, the underprivileged uh, uh, a stronger voice, if that makes sense. And the opposite of you, I am pessimistic about the future. <laughs> I think that this is just a capitalist society, and so capitalism is a new format, which I don't have the answers to because I'm an artist, not a um, not somebody who manages money because I can't even think of the word right now. Um, a communist. Um, I think that that has to change fundamentally because I think any format of capitalism is it is predicated on the fact that somebody has to be at the bottom. So I think that somebody will always suffer no matter what. Um, but you know, there are little things that I do to try to combat that it, as far as my practice. Um, I like to use ephemeral materials because they don't last. And the first thing someone says to me is, how much does that cost? And you can't buy it <laughs> because it's going to melt and you are never going to experience this ever again. Um, and it's kind of, in some ways, like my middle finger to the market because yes, I want to sell work and survive, but the idea of something selling for a hundred or two hundred million dollars when that's more than the GDP of a country is absurd to me. It's absolutely absurd to me. And I don't want to participate in that. Um, I just want to pay off my student loans, <laughs> send my child to college, pay off my mortgage. As long as I can keep a practice, I am satisfied. Um, but I will continue to make work that is not something tangible, that is not something that you can take home with you, but is more of an experience. Um, and that is why um, I continue to make work with sugar. And people oftentimes want to buy that work. That is the work that people want the most from me, and it's the work that you will never, ever be able to acquire, unless they buy my molds. And I give explicitly short because I'm not very good. <laughs> Well, I, I think that's brilliant, and I, I also um, think that you know the, the, not only does the world need artists, but I think the world needs all types of art. And, and I have to like really stress that because um, just in, in pure numbers, there are a lot of artists, mm -hmm. right? But I think it's important that there are artists that are still interested in doing things that are uh, more about um, you know so a, a temporary moment and not necessarily something that has to physically last forever. Um, I'm very romantic in that way that I, I like to think about things that um, are sort of outside of the norm of, of like the, the normal interactions, like the transactional interactions, but thinking about things that are a bit more sort of like petty or spiritual in some regards. But I also think that there's a place for both, and there's a, and there's a way to. I don't want to be poor. Not necessarily. <laughs> right, right, I, I'm not about to start giving you career advice. I'm just talk, I'm just talking. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking aloud. Um, I think that there's I think that there's a way um, for both to exist. But I also think that kind of gets back to the heart of what the exhibition is also trying to touch on in some regards. Like for example, I know that you know there are eight other artists in the show, and so. I want to at least talk about one or two of them in the context of this conversation, not to put words into their mouth, but to sort of talk about my experience and, you know, sort of talking to them and hearing from them and what they have to say about what it is they're doing. I mean, um, you know, I, I know that, for example, 
Um, it, like you've worked with Lucy a couple times, so maybe you could you could speak about her. I'll talk about Leonardo Benzet because you know why not. Um, so I know that you know as an artist, he he has a sculpture on the third floor, right in the center of the room. Um, I know that as an artist, what he's been attempting to do is try to navigate a space in between his spiritual beliefs, his um, artistic desires, and then also his um, his political sort of like inclinations, which is sort of like a tough space to be in at some point in time. So, you know, you, you know, to make work that you want to see have a life beyond you, and perhaps that means in a collection or in a museum, but also that work as a vessel in a way to sort of deal with some of the more sort of personal, spiritual um, journeys that he's on, you know, thinking about his connection to, you know, um, you know like, um, like Voodoo and, and, and other, and other um, you know, um, beliefs and, and thinking about how the work can be uh, a vessel for that, but then also when you make something that's so spiritually meaningful to you, what does it mean to then sell that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we've had many conversations about that paradox, right? Like if the work is an exercise in spirituality, but also you have these physical needs to, you know, to exist in this economy and how that kind of constantly puts you in this space where you're like thinking and rethinking and thinking and rethinking. It's not just to belittle someone who, you know, just makes small paintings and sells them, but it's a it's a much more complicated relationship with the work, right? When the work is connected to your deep spiritual and religious beliefs. I think you can hope that whoever's buying your work is buying it with the intentions of it being meaningful to them. I mean, everybody wants that kind of collection. But the reality of that is that that's not gonna happen. Like people are gonna flip your work. They may present themselves as one way and then they flip your work. Um, I try to focus primarily on institutions because I would like my work to be used in an educational way. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that collectors can't buy my work, but I am, I try to be very, I have the ability to say no to a collector who wants to buy my work. Like I will say that my gallery is, we see eye to eye on where the work should be placed, especially some works are just not appropriate to be in someone's house above their couch. You know, I have some works that talk about my family. Like, I don't want my grandmother's portrait in somebody's house. Mm -hmm. You know, like, that just would feel gross. Um, so we are in alignment of what pieces should go to an institution and what pieces should, are, should be purchased by a collector. And that's how I sort of delineate that. Um, and then there are things that no one will ever have, you know? Um, but I, I mean, I, I think that um, there's room for all of it. I, I do I do agree, like I don't believe that, you know, that's the art world, we can never have my stuff. I don't believe that because I have bills to pay just like everybody else. Um, and I think it's fine that we're allowed to make money from our labor. We put a lot of work into this and I don't think that people really um, understand <coughs> the amount of work that artists do. They're, oh, I could do that, I could just throw something in the canvas. No, it really does not, it doesn't work like that whatsoever. So I'm fine with people making money from their work. Um, I, I'm just very careful about what I choose to um, let others consume of me. Yeah, and I kind of want to piggyback off that. Um, I definitely agree with you 100%. Um, but in my case, I kind of trust my gallery, um, galleries with the nest to kind of um, do that whole interaction type thing. Um, but there are works that I also don't have for sale. And I think. The stuff with your dad. Yeah, the, the, the stuff with my dad. Um, so. Yeah, and this is very related. Okay, so my dad worked in tourism. Mm -hmm. He was a power sale operator. Um, and for, for him, he never got the work that I did. So the work that I did was always dark and grotesque, and his thing was, why don't you do something that the tourists <laughs> would love, uh, would enjoy? So his, his vision of my work was a seascape, something very small and compact that they could put in their suitcase. <laughs> yeah, paradise, that's being paradise. Um, so, Every time I would go home, again, so he, he was in power sailing, so every time I would go home to visit um, from school or, or from just living here, I would go home and in the backyard would be his parachutes that he used for the day. He would have that draped across the entire backyard. 
and he would, sp he would the reason he's doing that was he's spraying it down to get rid of the sea salt um, so it doesn't deteriorate the um, the, the fabric in the, in the parachute and also the rope. So one day I kind of proposed, I said, Dad, we should, we should collaborate. Um, and at this time I was very deep in my Joseph Campbell to do. And there was a line that Joseph Campbell spoke about, about um, it, it pretty much said, the son's succession of his father in hope of winning favor of his mother. So this was a rite of passage. The son's succession of his father in hope. So I kind of wanted to use that as a jumping off point for this project. And I, um, at the time, I proposed it to the National Art Gallery of the Bahamas. And they agreed to do it, but during this time, I was traveling a lot, as usual. Um, so our schedules never aligned. Um, and in 2015, he got sick. He found out he had stage four cancer, and he died very rapidly. Probably within four months, he was he was deceased. Um, and during that time, I was a postdoctoral fellow at the, uni of the, at the University of North Carolina, and I decided to put that aside. So I actually resigned from that position um, to go back home to spend time with my dad in his last months. Um, and one of the things that he, he was very optimistic, actually. <laughs> about okay, so he he's in stage four cancer. I mean, everybody knows it's kind of hard to get out of that after stage four. So he, his thing was, if ever I am able to get out of this situation, meaning the cancer, I would travel with you, travel with you wherever you go. So the notion of journey became a thing. And again, remember, I'm I'm studying this hero's journey thing. Um, so anyway, obviously he did not make it. Um, but ever since that, I have been post posthumously collaborating with him. So the project, I mean, it probably, yeah, actually this is it. Actually this is one of them. Um, so we've been collaborating. So his, his, um, his contribution to the collaboration is obviously the parachute, which is full of stains and full of patchwork sewn by him and the ropes are, are, are still plotted by him, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in that, that image that, that was shown with the parachute, um, my collaboration was the funerary urn. And in that urn housed my father's ashes. Um, and prior to his death, obviously, um, not obviously, but he wanted to be cremated. And he, he asked me to rent two yachts and with my family, sprinkle his, his ashes in the ocean. Um, I sprinkled half of the ashes, and the next half I wanted to fulfill this notion of journey. So speaking of not for sale, like this work has will never be for sale, and it's been exhibited all over the world, um, and it will be continued. It will continue to be exhibited um, as time progresses. So, and when you talked about that, this, we're in a show together at the Perez this summer, and we met last year to discuss these readings that we had done. And when you talked about that work, I was like, it made me want to cry because I have a very um, difficult relationship with my own father and to see that you had spent this much time to make this body of work um and that it was it was just a really touching series of work and just really beautiful and that just made me admire your practice way more than i already admired it you know i just thought that was a really beautiful tribute to him thank you uh so we know you got questions so we want to turn it over to you. Um, I guess, do we have a mic or are people to stand up? No, if you could stand up. If you could stand up and tell us your name too. I know some of you are, some of you are, I don't know. So this, this gentleman over here, look familiar. <laughs> Hi, my name is Andre. Um, good to see you some friends in the Bay Area. Um, first of all, I am so thankful like, personally to hear you all talk about your ancestry, photography, spirituality, um, as a part of your work, but also just how you move through the world. I feel like as I sat here, I felt that. Um, I'm very curious about what your process is like, especially if you listen to music, and if there was any kind of music that you listened to during um, exploring and creating these. What, what was your playlist? Is it directed to somebody in particular, or everybody? 
Oh, I can answer. Well, I'm a, I'm a young man with an old man, so <laughs> I listen to talk radio constantly. <laughs> and the talk radio is usually big from the Bahamas. Um, and for me, it definitely keeps me connected. So even though I've been gone for 15 years, sometimes I tell my family news before they find out the news. Because, um, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really connected. <laughs> I'm really connected in that way. So that's, so, so that's my playlist um, for the most part. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's basically pop radio. Okay, so Real Housewives of Anything. <laughs> <laughs> I like trashy TV because I can play it in the background and I don't have to pay attention to it and I already get the gist of what's happening. But just like also all the hip hop I can't listen to in front of my child. Um, I have to have music in the background. Like, I can't work in silence. It's so silent that it's loud. Um, and usually if I have music on, I'm like dancing while I'm making work. It's, it's the, it just, it gets me in a zone to where, like there's this particular zone that you get into when you start making and you're really in it. It becomes like, um, it's almost like yoga. Like you kind of lose yourself and it becomes really spiritual and meditative. And I have to have something on playing um, that just gets me into that, so. And actually on the music note too, just to take you back off that. So if I listen to music, I'll listen to one song on repeat for the entire time. That's kind of hard. Hi, I'm Stewie. Um, from Kingston. Um, I was sort of wondering, so you've been working with is how much do we let current affairs affect the work that we're doing now? Um, Andrea being working materially and me using um, a lot of literature. Um, and for me, I think everything is, so I'm working from a historic point, but it all makes sense today, you know, um, in a very, succinct way, but a very unapologetic way, you know, so I'm not, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm very aware. Yeah. Oh yeah, and, and I think yeah, yeah, one of the, 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 the works I can speak about um, in that way is, is the gun dog series, so it's the, the, the dogs made of a cardboard. And initially when I, when I began making it, I made it as a shadow to a street gang that I grew up around as a kid, as a teenager. Um, and as the series continued, I began to, s to think about this, the, no the role of the, do the dog within societies, both past and present. Um, past iterations of the dogs, dogs were used to hunt runaway slaves. Hunt and sometimes kill runaway slaves. Today, we have the police dog. It's the exact same thing happening, whereby black and brown and white bodies, I mean, are, are, are hunted by these animals, viciously hunted by these animals, sometimes killed by these animals. So, so there, there, there's a very close parallel between those two eras within, within the world today. And I think most of the work, even the paintings, kind of have the same kind of dialogue that happens. Um, I think it's kind of along the lines of the question that Dexter asked about like post-colonialism. Post -colonialism. Um, I don't really think that we're in a post-colonial state, so for me, it's all current. I feel like a lot of, like I said before, um, you know, moving from one service economy to the next, um, you know, we're still, we're given the illusion of freedom, but we have so much restriction. Um, and for me, I'm 
I was born here, so I'm looking at everything from a first generation perspective. And also my mom is from Trinidad. So I'm looking at two like different countries that hate each other. <laughs> you know, and you know, what does that mean to come from two opposing countries that are still seen as outsiders in a lot of ways and still struggle from the same thing and feel the need to compete with one another. You know, so um, I think that the way that I make work still speaks to everything, colorism, like um, segregation, everything. I think it's it's all still pretty relevant in the work. This gentleman in the back. Hi, uh, Manny Gonzalez. How are you, Manny? How are you? Um, I'm, I'm intrigued with, uh, with the exhibition and I look forward to seeing all of your work, but I want to go back to something that you talked about, Andrea, and that is the role of hymns or the Bible and slavery. But for me, the larger context is Christianity and its role in conquering Africa. Mm -hmm. And so without having the benefit of seeing all the work, what, what role or how far do you go back in terms of explaining the role of Christianity and colonialism? Um, Personally speaking, I, I see Christianity was used as a weapon to conquer Africa, mm -hmm. and, and now you have evangelicals supporting Mr. Orange, Agent Orange in the White House. So what, what, uh, what role do you see Christianity really playing in uh, Afro-Caribbean culture, or the Caribbean in general? Mm -hmm. I still think it's used as a tool. Like, I don't think that ever stopped. Um, like I said, I think the Bible has been used, or just Christianity in general, or just religion in general, has been used to marginalize lots of people. I mean, you can use it to justify um, banning same-sex marriage. You know, like it's still pretty relevant. Um, and I just think that it's a really arrogant notion that someone thinks that we need to be civilized. Like, we need to be civilized because we're so savage that we don't even understand what it is to be civil. I think that takes a ton of arrogance that you feel the need to, to do that and, and use that as a way to justify conquering and continuing to punish people. That takes a lot of arrogance. Um, so I don't really think much has changed. I mean, um, if you look around Africa and you can see the influence of Christianity, um, nothing, nothing's really changed. Nothing's really changed. If you look around the Caribbean. Yes, that too. <laughs> <laughs> Nassau, if you look at Jamaica, yeah, it's a different story. Um. Um, so I, I wanted to actually just pivot a little bit. And um, I know it's something that you said that you go to Senegal. I think there's this, um, there's this, this vision that the rest of the world kind of has to, is kind of seen in a lens of Western um, measures, right? Mm -hmm. But if you, if you, especially if you've grown up in the Bahama or Ghana or um, as an African American in America, uh, going against the system and creating your own vision of what art is and what music is and what literature is is very much alive. And I, I always, um, I always struggle with the fact that if you go to Africa. Um, there's a billion people there. And those billion people, most of them, there might be like small, you know, little amounts of people that live in the city that kind of are westernized and follow this narrative. But the rest of the world, and I'm talking about Asia and the, just about the rest of the whole world, South America, everybody has their own cultural uh, narrative. And, and you know books that kids, young kids, they're all following. They're not they're not reading Nancy Drew or whatever whatever is here. Or, so, um, and the art that comes out of that. I know there's like this art that comes here, and we sit we see like African art or South American art or Asian art. But it's it's um, it gets lost. You know that that rich culture it gets lost because there is that that Western narrative that says this is the measure and this is what you have to. And African Americans in this country have been fighting against that, and we know what what that brings to you. 
But so I wanted you to talk a little bit about that because you, you, you brought it up that you know you go to Senegal and real life is not really that small narrative. And I know that small narrative is, has a big megaphone, but there is so much richness there, right? And I don't know how it is that you could, we can bring that richness out because the majority of people are not talking about you know, what we're struggling against here, the learned people, mm -hmm. yeah? So I think, first of all, the beautiful thing is the exchange that's happening very rapidly um, within black art worldwide. Mm -hmm. So there's this thing, and I, I think early on, probably around 2014, 2015, it became maybe like a, a fashionable thing to kind of seek artists of color, but now it feels as if it's becoming a bit more concrete. We've been left. <laughs> <laughs> then it felt like a moment, but now it kind of feels like, okay, we've, we've been left with the narrative for so long. Now it's making sense that these people have a, a real voice, something to say. Um, I think growing up in the Bahamas for me, I always grew up as the majority. So I always had this majority attitude. And I think for that, I was able to kind of navigate America the way I have. I mean, I, I came here as a 21 year old and I'm here now. Um, but again, it's from that mentality. Um, so I can say that for myself, but I also know people who have a very, segregation is a thing for them. Mm -hmm. You know, so they have this very us and them type of mentality, um, which I think can be crippling. But again, this is the vast majority of people I'm speaking about, you know? Um, and I think, again, I can only speak for, for myself. And again, out of Senegal, there are a few people who are now emerging, like coming out. I think Omar Ba. Yeah, yeah. So, so he's he's kind of one of, he's a good one. But I think there are other like kind of forerunners who are really getting a voice in the contemporary. So outside of Africa, outside of Senegal, but in the contemporary sense, they're just really doing like very, very challenging work, you know. And again, a lot of the work seems to be kind of colonial driven, but again, giving a voice to to the oppressed, which I think is a beautiful thing that that's happening within within um, within the world. But I definitely think we are here. We, meaning people of color, are here to stay. I mean, we, it's a forward movement now, and again, it's it's good to see the wave of everybody moving forward um, together, you know. And also, people like us paving the path for people behind us who, who are, again, just as hungry or even hungrier than we are. I hope that answered the question somewhat. No? I don't think you're satisfied with that answer. <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know what, let's, let's go to the next one because we could spend a lot of time on that one. We can pick that up after. Um, two more questions. So the gentleman in the, in the red hat, and then you in front of him, and then the lady with the green. Thank you. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot lately as far as just the process of creating and I kind of wanted to know what you guys' process is. Like, I think a lot of people, at least a lot of artists, don't necessarily know exactly what they want to do. You guys seem very educated on these topics. But um, do you guys, in the beginning, did you guys know this is what I want to say? This is what I want to do? Or are you guys finding it out now? Or, you know, one, one piece of advice that I got in grad school was that you should ask yourself a question that you can't answer. If you can't answer that question too easily, you ask the wrong question. Um, so I'm constantly trying to figure things out. Like I, I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like I know what I'm doing. This is constantly evolving. Um, but I didn't know what I was gonna make for this show. <laughs> You know, and then when I installed yesterday, it took on a totally different life than what I anticipated. Um, and a lot of that is just um, intuition, how you feel when you get into the space, how you know people are gonna move around the space. Um, I did not, when I went to grad school, I was just trying to get a receipt uh, with a degree so that I could get a job. I was like, I'm gonna teach because I don't know what else I can do with myself. Um, so no, the, none of this was ever planned. It's just constantly asking the question and seeing how far I can push it and then seeing how far I can push the material. Like, what else can I do with this material? Like, I, I try to constantly give myself challenges. So every time I do a project, I generally teach myself something new. So I also make a series of cyanotypes, which I did not know how to do. I made myself a dark room and a half bathroom that is like the size of this table. 
and push myself to learn how to use the material. And it's a material that you will never master. It's constantly changing. Um, everything affects it. The rain. I can't work when it rains. Those aren't things you can like plan for. It's just shit that happens. Um, so I, I make it so that my process is, co is constantly learning and that I want to entertain myself and then entertain everyone else later. But it's always about what's making me the happiest and I think that's something that you really got to hold on to is what's most satisfying to you as, as a maker. Like I just, I love making, like I don't even care about the finished product a lot of the times, it's just the act of making and discovering how to make something new. Like I learned how to make paper and that was just like, the coolest thing ever. Just the instant gratification of knowing that you made a sheet of paper that you can then do anything with. That's amazing, because we just go to the store and buy stuff and like take it for granted. So for me, it's a constant exploration of like learning how to make something new and how can I incorporate that to things that I'm thinking about currently. Um, and I, I think that the, the answer to your question about, um, you know, uh, people sort of seeming like they know they got it all figured out, I, I'm paraphrasing, they got it all figured out or not. Uh, it's kind of like a false, it's like a false thing. I mean, most people don't have much figured out at all. Um, they just pretend like they do. Um, and and I, can, I can only speak for myself, but you know, the work that I do curatorially, I don't consider myself an artist. Um, and I know that some curators might consider themselves to be artists, but I don't consider myself to be an artist. Um, I consider myself to be someone who is like a, in, a, in a very um, privileged position to be able to give artists platforms and an opportunity because of the relationships that I either have or I'm developing. I mean, the work that I do is informed by the same things that would inform you, you know, it's informed by the people around me, it's like informed by my, my wife and my children, it's informed by the, the sort of like the strange existence that I now have, uh, I'm kind of getting personal here, but you know, it, it's, it's, it's informed by a lot of things, you know, and it kind of dovetails a little bit to, like, to your question. You know, history, and this again, I'm speaking for myself here, I'm not speaking for the panel, I'm speaking for myself. History is, is still being made, right? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we think about ourselves as almost like these like little, little boats kind of floating mm -hmm. on a sea of history with no control over where it takes us or, or, or where we've been. But I believe we have, a, I believe we do have control and agency. And so these perspectives that people have, meaning that sort of like Western perspective of seeing art and seeing the world through a very you know, specific kind of like uh, lens. Um, I constantly challenge myself to look through other lenses, to not have this sort of uh, Americentric or Eurocentric or even to a great degree, African-American or Black-centric way of seeing things because there are a lot of different ways to look at the world. Um, and so the, the exercise of being a curator for me it's about constantly trying to, to your, your point, sort of like challenge myself to think about things in a different way and ask myself questions that I don't know the answer to and being willing to expose myself to the potential of massive failure, <laughs> you know? Because not everything works out, you know? And, and it's a big collaboration. It's a collaboration with artists, right? It's a collaboration with other curators. It's a collaboration with institutions. Um, and, and I don't want to oversimplify it, but I would just say that don't, don't think that you have to get to this point where you have anything completely figured out before you move forward. You just got to move forward. Yeah, so um, I agree with, with, with this both of um, both, both uh, what was said. Um, yeah, but my, I'm, I'm deep in research, you know, so it's, it's, it's always research first for me. Um, but from that research, how do I complicate things? You know, so it's retelling stories that are being told and calling people liars and, and, and that type of stuff through 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 visual through through visual language. You know, um, but I think complication becomes a, a very um, important thing for me, and it's all also kind of knowing that art isn't about art. You know, we're interested in economics, we're interested in anthropology, we're interested in religion. And we go on and on with, 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 with themes. And from those themes, you, I mean, what I do is I, I, I tend to want to couple with institutions. You know, so artists don't, do, don't really do postdoctoral fellowships. But I did a postdoctoral fellowship, again, to kind of sharpen my toolbox. Um, and again, just using that research that resulted in work, that resulted in work that was in the Venice Biennale for instance, that came from a postdoctoral fellowship. 
So those are the things that kind of fuel me and then also real life experiences. So how do I couple what I'm reading with 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 history, with what I'm living to with with what I lived with as a kid to what to what I'm living with today. So how how do I make these parallels in a very succinct but but also effective way is, is how I kinda of always think about things. And then the research expands, you know, I'm on the same research from two thousand ten. And we're now 2019, and I'm still not even halfway done. <laughs> so so that's, that, that's what fuels my work. I think for me it's a mixed bag of research, um, traveling to places. So like, it's funny. Um, I used to go to Nassau a lot. And for some reason I stopped going 10 years ago. I don't really know why. But um, a couple weeks ago I had an opportunity to go lecture and I was thinking about Navarre's work and I actually went to the neighborhood where he grew up and it sharpened my understanding of his work and the conversation that he is putting forth through his practice. And the same thing with Andrew Otero, there's a sculpture behind you guys behind that glass, going to Puerto Rico, going to his neighborhood where he grew up and beginning to understand you know, the ripple effects of colonialism through architecture, right? Which is not something that I was consciously thinking about but now it helps me think about this work in a different way and then articulate you know, my perspective on this work in a different way. So it's a, it's a mix of research experiences, listening, talking to artists, talking with other curators, and, and trying to find those aha moments. And a lot of times that's where shows come from. So like Monday night I was at another institution you know, for an event and I was talking to a curator who's first generation Korean American. And I have a show that I'm doing in the fall and I had no ideas. And she said something to me about um, you know, us being children of immigrants and what were the things that our parents told us to make us feel special, important, elite, in, in a space that they always try to demonize you because you're different. And I sat with that and then came up with a whole idea for an exhibition, mm -hmm. 10 artists and like, you know, so, it's, 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 a, it's a mixed bag in terms of how things come to fruition. But I try to make sure that it's organic and it's true when it comes to me. Because, you know, Dexter and I, were, we, we didn't go to art school. So we, we've learned through doing, uh, we've learned through working and collaborating, so. This gentleman over here. I forgot my trick on time. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> this lady over here. Oh, you already understand, but well, my name's Imani Triplett. Um, I'm a historian and I, America has a problem with rep repressive forgetting or forgetting to push a, a false narrative, which we see a lot with Confederates, you know, and we have all these statues up, but we don't acknowledge the his true history behind it, you know. They say, oh, they're great military generals, or what you're talking about with the slave photos, you know, it wasn't all, you know, fun and games. They weren't laying in the field, you know, half the time they were whipped because of that issue. So how do you artists like yourselves and curators like yourself keep from the erasure of history from people that may not enter an institution as MOAD or something like, or an institution like this? Like how would you help prevent that erasure of uh, history? Well, it's a complicated question. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if, if, I have, uh, if I have the right answer or if there is a right answer, um, but I'll, I'll make an attempt. Um, I think that what we all do as artists and curators is an attempt at not only um, telling our own stories, but telling the stories of other people as well, as best we can. Um, I think that the relationship between um, artists and institutions, whether it's MOAD or others, is one that I know it can be fraught from time to time. I mean, oftentimes, and you mentioned this earlier, Larry, you were talking about like, you know, the, the concept of like decolonizing the art world, like decolonizing museums. Well, the thing that I think about often is that, and again, it gets back to the root of this exhibition, is that we all live in, a, in an ecosystem or a framework that wasn't necessarily of our choosing or of our own doing. So we're existing in it. So when you talk about these uh, you know, Confederate statues or, or, or um, some of the other things that you mentioned, you know, those are things that, have existed for a very long time because there was a power structure in place that not only erected them, well conceived them, erected them, and sustained them, 
And so we're now at a point in history, capital H history, where we can actually think about dismantling those things, but doing it in a way that's not just simply going and knocking them over, but really thinking about dismantling the mindset that's led to those things. I mean, you know, I'll be the first one to tell you that there are a lot of artists out there that look at even what we're doing in here right now as being part of a system that they don't want to have anything to do with. And so I don't put myself in a situation where I feel like I've somehow like been elevated above or separate from, you know. Um, and, and I think that we should always acknowledge the reality that despite any individuals in here, you know, you might, we could all point to our own challenges and our hardships, but by the very nature of having time to be here on a Sunday evening and not be like working at a toll booth or like, you know, babysitting somebody else's kids, you've already kind of entered into a space where you have time to feed your mind. A lot of people don't have that time. So I think about that all the time, right? Time, time, time. I think about that all the time. Um, and so I, I guess this is my roundabout way of saying that, you know, we're in a position to perpetuate uh, different narratives, create and perpetuate different narratives, and hopefully infiltrate certain power structures to change them for the better, or at least as how we perceive to be the better. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question, but that's like my best attempt at it. No. I, I think to piggyback that, for me personally, I've just been thinking about other spaces to activate conversations and dialogues, because that's what these exhibitions represent for me. Whether it's online, whether it's through social media, whether it's through public programming. Um, Maya, who stepped out to the bathroom, um, did a series of performances. What was it, 10 sites? Um, seven. Seven sites around San Francisco, you know. So like, doing a performance in a in a space like the Tenderloin, which those of y'all who are from here know how complicated that history is and what that space has become. And so activating in public space, you know, even if you see it and don't really understand it, you see that it's a gesture by this artist to hold space and engage people in that community. And so, for me personally, it's trying to think about a multitude of ways to kind of express ideas, ask questions, collaborate. Um, but I think collaborating with Moab has been incredible and I think it's a great platform um, for this exhibition um, because they've been open and receptive to all our ideas. Um, and they really want to have this conversation in a, in, in a meaningful and generative way. And so how do we continue to work within the system but then also work outside of the system? and then push from both sides to really you know, push things forward. Yeah, I think from an artist's point of view, I mean, the first thing I think about is, of is the role of an artist. The role of an artist is not to make art, but it's to observe. So we observe the work. We observe our communities. We observe through dialogues, through travel, through reading. Like those are the things that kind of fuel us. Um, and institutionally, I mean, I can think about many gallery spaces and, and institutional spaces that can be very intimidating to the general public. I mean, big walls, big glass doors. I'm a, do I belong? You know, so the notion of belonging becomes a thing. Um, but yeah, also the piggyback of, 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 of Larry, I think, um, public programming and public performances and, and utilizing alternative spaces. So, so what, if, what, what if an exhibition happens in a friend's apartment? Mm -hmm. What if an exhibition happens in a storefront? What if we are utilizing flagpoles to, 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 to exhibit works that, 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 that bring that brings us to a place of, of communion, but also a place of conversation. So I think these are the things that that, that, that artists are beginning to utilize, um, but I think could be utilized a bit more. Um, just to kind of include more, uh, I mean, I guess, a, 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 a vast majority of people. I mean, right now, it kind of feels like museum spaces become very enclosed. Gallery spaces, oh, it's, it's who, it's the who or who, you know, it isn't the general public for the most part, who, who wants to kind of come and enter those spaces. So I guess accessibility is, I say all that to say accessibility. <laughs> I'm gonna ask one of your 
talking about accessibility, my audience are my parents because they don't understand art, they don't care about art, they don't see the value of art. They grew up super poor, you know, like that's a luxury. The fact that I'm an artist is a privilege. And I never forget that. So as long as they can understand the work, then I feel like they're getting something for it and it makes it more approachable. And I think for me it's always about making something that you don't have to go to art school to understand this. You can just gain something from it. And a lot of that has to do with the materials that I use. Um, and as for what you were talking about, like the erasure of history, I'm interested in the attempt to erase the history. Not so much what they're trying to erase, but the effort that went into trying to erase that. So like, I'm really fascinated with the lost cause. Um, um, for those of you who don't know, it was this effort to basically make white people feel better about losing the Civil War. So books were written. Um, like There was this effort to create literature that would make white folks feel better about losing and sort of romanticize the South. So Gone with the Wind is an example of that. All of these monuments that have been erected is a result of that. The Confederate flag is not what the Confederate flag actually looked like. Those things were all designed as part of this lost cause to ease the, the feeling of defeat for have, losing the war. So I'm interested in that. I'm interested in like fabricating this and creating this mythology of history to <coughs> deny what actually happened because you can't get over it. Like just suck it up and deal with it. But they perpetuated this idea over and over again. Um, so when we were in Prospect, um, was it last year, the year before, in New Orleans, they were just taking down the Lee Monument, and the contractor that was um, hired to remove it, the public found out who it was, and they set his, um, his car on fire. So when people had to go remove it, they had to wear masks and everything like that. And just the fact that there was that effort to set this man's car on fire and that they had to disguise themselves, that to me is interesting. That is a historic event that is fascinating to me, that you would go to that length to do something like that. And if that event is captured, then there will never be history that's erased. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. We will conclude the conversation. Thank you, LeVar, Andrea, Dexter. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Moad. Thank you, Andrea.